Welcome to WCAT TV Radio. I'm Kiki Latimer, and I'm your host for the Catholic Bookworm and author of Home for the Homily and Seeing God's Face. We have with us here today Father Burke Masters, who's written this wonderful book. I'm really excited about it, A Grand Slam for God, and it's his journey from baseball star to Catholic priest. Exciting book, wonderful book. Um, welcome, Father. Thank you. Good to be with you, Kiki. And uh, yeah, I'm here. I'm the pastor of St. Isaac Jogues Parish in Hinsdale, Illinois, which is a western suburb of Chicago. And uh, yeah, a joy to be with you here to talk about this, this book that just came out. Mm, thank you. How about you start us off with a quick prayer? Be happy to. Thank in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you for all the blessings you've showered down upon us. We ask you to flood us with your grace. Open our hearts to hear you speaking deep within us. And give us the courage and the discernment to always follow your will. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. So it's a wonderful book. I mean, it's beautifully written. Um, the title um, may give many people the impression that it's sort of just for seminarians and priests, um, but it's so directed to families and the laity um, that it was, it's just really, really exciting. Yeah, it's interesting when uh, we were talking with Word on Fire, you know, they always say, what's your target audience? And it was hard to narrow that down, you know, because... Yes, I, I'm, I'm a convert to the faith, so I think it could, you know, uh, help people who aren't Catholic learn more about the, the Catholic faith. I became a priest, so it could be used in vocational discernment, uh, but also just the experiences of life, I think, have taught me so much that would help the family, that would help anyone who is just trying to grow in their relationship with Christ. So, And I've heard from people from all walks of life, people who love baseball, who <laughs> maybe don't know God to people who are on fire Catholics who don't know anything about baseball and, and everything in between. So I think there's a little bit of everything, little, little bit of something for everyone. There absolutely is. Yeah. And it's such a, it's such an easy book to read. It was just a page turner. It was fun. Mm -hmm. One of the things that very early in the book um, that I loved was, you know, you were in, you came from a basically unchurched family your parents were brought up as Christians, but they themselves didn't continue um, to go to church or have the children baptized, correct? Correct, um, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, interesting. Both of my grandmothers were church ladies. <laughs> so <laughs> they both played the organ in their respective churches, so the United Church of Christ and the Baptist Church. And then so my parents were raised to go to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, and then when they got married, they said it wasn't like they made a decision not to go to church. They just, life got busy as it does for a lot of families. And they said they, you know, missed a Sunday, missed another Sunday, and then eventually they just stopped practicing. So by the time I came along as the youngest of three boys, uh, we weren't going to church at all. So basically, really good moral people. Um, I remember praying a little bit in the house but otherwise had little to no formal religious training at all. I think that's the case for many families today. It's not that they make a deliberate decision to leave God or leave the church, but life gets crazy, life gets busy. Mm -hmm. um, you're exhausted on Sunday morning, um, and you, you slip away more gradually. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I think today another thing is, is sports you know like when I grew up sports was big and you know <laughs> Sunday was just another day to watch or play sports and I think even more now in today's culture where all the travel teams and uh, the practices the games the people are all over and so I, I think it's it's hard it people really have to make a concerted effort to go to church on Sunday rather than it used to be kind of the calendar was cleared on Sunday and you went to church and then Not you had anymore. family time. Not anymore. Um, so it's a very different culture. And, and so I think it's a, it's a rich culture 
for evangelization. You know, there's a, there's a, a big need and um, I like challenges. So for example, I have a, a school here with 550 children and so lots of families and unfortunately a good percentage of them don't go to church yet they send their children to catholic school so we try to um find ways that will make this not only attractive because it's not just about you know uh entertaining people but really making them want to come to to worship god uh every sunday I grew up in a similar, my husband and I are both converts as well, and um, I grew up much more unchurched, um, and it was really, you mentioned early on in your book, the importance of friends, and, and other families who took an interest in you, um, and that was my experience as well, we had, we had a, a friends of the family um, who were, you know, pretty strong Anglicans, and they made a point of coming to pick the kids up for church on Sundays. Mm -hmm. My parents were both disabled and, and couldn't bring us. So it, I really credit my journey beginning in a large part, not completely, um, but with their interest in us. Um, and their sharing their faith with, with me uh, was very important. And uh, I think it's important for families to realize that sometimes even that little tiny bit of reaching out to the kid next door, the kid down the street, in schools, um, plant seeds makes a world of difference. Yeah, I think I think that's a great idea. And um, I know for me, my baseball friends are actually what led me to the Catholic high school. <laughs> um, and then it was while I was there that one of my teachers and coaches, uh, he and his wife, the way they lived their Catholic faith was really intriguing for me and uh, and they started inviting me to go to church with them and so those friends made a huge impact on my my decision to become catholic and then obviously much later becoming a priest so i think families can we're not used to inviting people to go to mass with us you know um and i think we should start to think in that way of evangelization to you know maybe there are some neighbors who my, maybe my friend's kids don't go to church and we can invite them. I've, I've heard a lot of people who have converted because, you know, they started to go to the Catholic church and they realized, wow, this is beautiful. And the Eucharist starts to draw them in. We had a rule in our family. If, if a kid spent the night, you know, a neighbor's kid spent the night on a Saturday night, they had to go to mass, get, had to get up with the family and go to mass on Sunday morning. I wasn't going to drive them home. And but they had, you know, so they would check with their parents to make sure that was all right. And I remember being in mass one, one Sunday with this nine year old little boy. My boys were altar servers, so he was sort of stuck in the pew with, with me and my husband and the younger kids. And I turned to him and I said, um, you know, I kind of whispered, Have you ever been in a Catholic church before? Because I didn't know how unfamiliar this setting was to him. And he turned and he said to me, it with just just total bug eyes, he said, I've never been in any church before. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I mean, this is like 30 years ago now, that was incomprehensible to me. Mm -hmm. Like I could not come understand that a child could be completely unchurched, that a family would just never bring their children to any church. Yeah. Uh, it was really sad. Um, but he loved it. He loved it. I don't know what seed that planted, but um, it, it was it was an eye opening moment for me of how important it is to um, to find ways to evangelize young people. Yeah. yeah, I remember when I first went. I was I remember feeling at home, um, and after I got past the okay, when do I stand and when do I kneel? All of those mechanical things that were awkward at first. Uh, I really felt like there was something special here. Like I was, I was at home. That's the only way I could describe it. Little did I know, you know, eventually it would really be <laughs> home for me as a priest. Yeah. Yes. One of the themes that runs through the beginning of your book that, that was curious to me because you, you were brought up with very loving parents and a very loving family was this internal sense of not liking yourself. And, um, I'm just wanted to ask you about that. I don't yeah. yeah, I think as 
as a teenager, um, and even maybe a little bit younger than a teenager, you're going through all of these changes and you, um, it's, I think it's very common where you're always comparing yourself to other kids. And, and even though I, I was good in sports, I was a good student, um, I hadn't really found myself. And I think, I think part of it was I, I didn't know who I was in God. I didn't know myself as a beloved child of God, which becomes a big theme in the book. Um, and so I was really searching for my identity in other people. And I, I, I use the phrase now that comparing leads to despairing. You know, there's always somebody smarter, faster, better looking, you know, as, as you compare yourself to others, you're going to lose that game eventually. And so I think that's, I kept comparing myself and, and thinking, I don't measure up and I'm not, you know, I, I knew I was living a life, you know, I wasn't perfect. I, I had sin and uh, I just really didn't like myself in, in the sense. And I know that surprises people who know me today. Um, but I think it's a common thing that many teenagers go through until they really, you know, find themselves, ultimately find themselves as a beloved child of God. I thought it was sweet. You talked about Sister Margaret Ann and how she said to you, you know, that you're searching for someone, something, um, and that your heart was open to that. Yeah. Yeah. She she picked up on something very deep. Uh, God rest her soul. She just passed away about a year ago. Um, I was able to go to her, to her wake. And yeah, she was, and she was pretty young, uh, right. I think right in the convent when she was teaching us and she just had a really good way with young people. And I think they probably told her that I wasn't Catholic and, you know, to kind of help me ease into these religion classes but she picked up on that I was searching for something that I I couldn't get enough of the the theology classes. It was intriguing. It was new. Um, and yeah, she stopped me after class one day and she said, you're searching for something and gave me a Bible, my first Bible, which I still have. And uh, as I started to read the Bible, my heart started to say, this is what I'm searching for. This is who I've been looking for, this Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, so now one of my favorite lines by St. Augustine, you know, we were made for you, Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. My restless heart had found its home in Christ. And so, yeah, she had said I was looking for something, but I was really searching for someone. And I think she knew that. Yeah. Um, and now I, pro I approach every person with that mindset that whether they realize it or not, they're searching for Christ. And, uh, and so we have the answer and it should give us great confidence as ministers in the church or anybody who's in the church to know everybody is made by God and for God. And uh, we can help them find that place where their hearts can find rest. Now, during this early time in your life, obviously you thought you were searching for baseball. <laughs> And, yeah. and working really hard in that direction. Um, and I don't want to, you know, do too many spoilers for the book, but obviously it was, you were really having a struggle with that as you moved upward in that world. Yeah, my, baseball was my life. And uh, again, even though I started to learn my identity as a beloved son of God, um, I was getting such accolades as a baseball player and as a good student um, I thought, well, if I become a professional baseball player, those, then I'll really be a good person and people will like me, you know? I, um, and as I, as I study Father Spitzer's four levels of happiness, um, so if, if you've never heard of it before, the first level is finding happiness in basic things, food, water, sleep. The second level is, um, is winning. It's like becoming better than others. You know, it's this comparison game. The third level is helping others. So you start to think about other people. And then the fourth level is finding our happiness in God. And so I was stuck pretty much at that second level of I wanted to be a, you know, professional. People would like me. People would look up to me. Um, 
I was a good person, you know, I was very kind to people, but I was pretty self-focused. And, uh, uh, and I really thought as I climbed the ladder in, into college that I was in one of the best college programs in the country for baseball. And I really thought my, my dream was realistic. And people around me thought it was realistic too. So uh, um, they say we won't give the, the spoiler alert, but uh, <laughs> I had a lot of great experiences playing baseball. We live in a culture, obviously, that values people for what they do, for how they look and what they do, you know. And and um, you talk about, you know, that that sense of our of our identity um, can get stuck, like you said just now, in that that do level. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially, so it's interesting when when you ask a man, "Who are you?" They'll they'll often say they'll go to their career. You know, I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. I'm a teacher. And the problem with that is we have good days and bad days at work, or I identified myself as a baseball player, and boy, that was a, a wild roller coaster. Six for six on one day, and then 0 for four another day. And now I'm, you know, I'm chaplain for the Cubs, and I work with professional athletes. We've all seen professional athletes where when they retire, they can spiral out of control because... They sort of identify themselves with their career. Now that they're retired, they don't know who they are. And so that's why finding our identity as a beloved child of God is so important. When I ask a woman, who are you? And normally women say, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother. They get their identity from their relationships, which is good, but not exactly where it should be, right? Because if I identify, identify myself as a mother and my kids make poor decisions, then I think, <laughs> I'm a bad mother. I'm a bad person. Right. Uh, but the right. truth is, we're all beloved children of God. And if we can find that identity as our foundation, life will still be like a wild roller coaster. But we <laughs> can find that peace in, in the Lord. And that's why I found this this great sense of peace in my life that I don't I don't do things so people will like me anymore. I mean, we all have a, an, an innate desire to be liked right. but i don't that's not the determining factor of why i do what i do i do what i do because i love god i know who i am and i want others to come to know the lord as well because i think at some point we realize the other stuff can unravel like you're saying it can all unravel so easily relationships unravel um you know some, I, I remember when i first became a published author people were like oh now that you must be happy and it's like well, that's been happy, but that's my happiness isn't in that. Yeah. Um, because that comes and goes, you know. Um, yeah. You know, your our, book our is popular ultimate. today and gone tomorrow, you know. Yeah. And uh, relationships too, like you're saying, you if your relationships um, are, are are in a you know if your identity is in that relationship and the relationship falls apart or the kids are rotten or you know the yeah family, or pe you know. people go through a divorce or um, my spouse dies you know uh, if I'm not grounded if I if I've gotten if I've received my identity from my spouse in that relationship or from my children or wherever um, it can be rocked you know but if again that foundation this relationship. When we're baptized, God claims us as his beloved children, and it never changes. He might not like what we do sometimes. <laughs> you know, we might be, we might act sinfully at times, but it doesn't mean God doesn't love us. And he can't wait to forgive us when we come to him with a contrite heart. So just want to encourage uh, our listeners today to really think about where they get their identity from. And uh, if it's not in God, to, to seek that place of, of refuge in him. Yeah, that you know, we have that that immutability, that unchangeability of God that's just always there. He's always pouring out His love, um, and it doesn't depend on our goodness. <laughs> no. He just is love. He pours it out. How much we can receive of His love and forgiveness, you know, is yeah. dependent on our state and our turning towards Him. Um, but His love is just unchanging. Um, Probably similar to a, a mother with a newborn child, you know. What newborn children do is often not pretty, you know. <laughs> they eat, they cry, and they spoil their diaper. 
<laughs> and yet the mother loves them, you know, to no end. There's nothing that baby can do to earn their mother's love. It's just there. And, uh, you know, scripture talks about that comparison, you know, about the love of a mother, how much greater even is God's love for us, if we can even imagine that. And, and it's always there. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it's that's the game changer, I think, in life is learning to fu- uh, learning our identity uh, in in God. And then everything else falls into place. Mm-hmm. One of the themes that runs through your book that I love is that others see something in you long before you see it in yourself. And, mm. uh, I, th- I find that beautiful. And it's often the case, I mean, that others can s- know us better than we know ourselves. Yes. You know, my my mother knew before I did that I was called to be a priest, and she wasn't even Catholic. <laughs> uh, my brothers, I think, knew that before I did. And so it's really taught me that as I'm discerning big decisions in life, to talk to those people who know me well. So I think in discernment, I always first go to God, you know, in prayer and adoration. Lord, what is it that you're asking of me? But then also listen to those people who know you well, because they'll start to point out things. So, for example, in my priestly discernment, I I was going to adoration and I kept I kept thinking about the priesthood and it was involuntary. I did not want to be a priest. I wanted to be a ball player or eventually a general manager. And I said, God, if you want me to be a priest, you have to make this clear because it is not what I want to do. And then people would come to me out of the blue and say, you know, Brooke, I think you'd make a great priest. And it was like, God was doing this full court press. If I can use a basketball analogy. <laughs> he was you know, inviting me, but then he was also speaking to me through other people. And uh, that's how the Holy Spirit often works in my own life, listening to God and listening to my friends. I was I was fascinated by the woman. You said she was a total stranger, maybe an angel who just walked up to you and said to you, you're going to be a priest one day. Just- that was so powerful. I was, uh, it was we had coffee and donuts after mass one day and I was feeling strongly this call of the priesthood and I was feeling just as strong not to do it. And uh, I was just, I remember just eating a donut, just minding my own business. And this woman came up to me. I didn't know her. She didn't know me, but she said, you know, you're going to be a priest one day. And she walked away and I don't think I ever saw her again. So that's why I wonder if that was an angel of God that just, uh, God knew he had to hit me over the head with a two by four to do this because I had my life planned out and God wanted me to go in this different direction and he needed to uh, get my attention. And he, he certainly did that day uh, among many other uh, examples. I so had a, some- I, I had a cra- I just want to mention, I had a cra- cause it reminded me of it at the time I read it. I had a crazy example about 10 years ago experience in um i was in the rockaways and down in near, um, new york uh, i think it was thanksgiving and we were visiting with my my niece and we went to mass and in a church i've ne- had never been in before and have never been in since and it was a huge parish a huge church with quite a few priests and it was an elderly elderly priest probably an, you know, a retired pastor up on the altar and he could barely walk and he was hobbling with a cane and he was all bent over. He looked like he was 103. And clear as a bell, I heard God say to me, you, I have a message for him. And I've never had this happen to me before since. He said, you need to tell him that I'm not done with him yet. He has one more big thing he really has to do before he dies. So he can't give up yet. And you need to tell him that. And I was like, I'm not going up there and telling him that. But it stayed with me through the whole mass. And so finally, uh, mass ended. And I said to my husband, I'll be right back. I have to go to the sacristy. And the sacristy was full of altar servers and priests and really busy. And this little old guy was there all hunched over. And I said, excuse me, Father. I said, this has never happened before. I know you're going to think I'm a crazy person, but God has a message for you. I said, he said to tell you, he's not done with you yet. You have one more big thing to do before you die. And so don't give up yet. 
And I expected him to look at me and say, thanks, lady. It's been nice. That's good. You can yeah. let me you know, leave the sacristy now. Instead, he rushed toward me and threw his arms around me and hugged me and said, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm. <laughs> And that was yeah. it. And I left. I said, you're welcome. I don't know what it means. Goodbye. <laughs> and that's the beauty. It's like, you don't, you don't know what happened or what that message was for, but you, you listened no, and, and acted on back it. There. I have no idea. I'm hoping on the other side, I get to find out what that was all about. <laughs> I actually get that fairly often from people. Like people say, this may sound crazy, Father, but God asked me to tell you this. And <laughs> <laughs> Nine times out of ten, it it strikes right to my heart because like I've been thinking about something and God answered that prayer through this person, you know. So, yeah, it was clear to me that he was so open and receptive to that message, almost like he'd been waiting for it. Mm -hmm. um, that it was it's always amazed me. <laughs> Beautiful. Wow. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, that's really sweet. Oh my gosh. So. You talk at one point, I think it's an important thing, um, you know, your mom died. You had, it, was, it was not an easy time, to say the least, for you when your mm -hmm. mom passed. Very traumatic, um, which left you with a lot of anger. Mm -hmm. um, and for a while, you sort of lived with what you call this, it's a, the, the lie that good people don't get angry. Mm. That's a big one. Yeah. yeah. So I was in my first year of seminary, uh, and toward the end of the year, my mom was diagnosed with lung cancer. And so I came home, and I was helping dad take her to chemotherapy and doctor's appointments. And uh, the cancer had spread already, so it was stage four. Uh, but we were getting good news. The, they were doing aggressive treatment, and she was responding well. And then a couple months later, you know, and I've been praying every day for God to heal her. And, you know, I'm giving you my life as a, as a seminarian and a priest. Please just heal her. And two months later, she died suddenly um, from an, uh, like a, a blood vessel burst in her lungs. And it was horrific. And, and I thought, wow. I, I remember, I think it was St. Teresa of Avila who was riding in a carriage one day and she was just having a bad day, and to make matters worse, the carriage hit a rock and dumped her over into the mud. And, you know, she said, God, if this is how you treat your friends, I hate to see how you treat your enemies, you know. And I thought, I got angry with God. I believed the lie that God had abandoned me and us in our need. Um, and I was going through the stages of grief. I wasn't aware of that, but anger was one of those things that is very common in grief. I would, and I'm not an angry person. I, I was snapping at friends. I would say things and I thought, why did I say that? You know, um, now looking back on it, you know, as someone who helps people through grief, I see yeah. clearly what was happening. Um, and my spiritual director, uh, and I, I almost left the seminary. I was so angry with God. And I thought, if I'm angry with God, how can I be a priest? And so my spiritual director said, you need to go back to that night uh, that your mom died. And I said, I'm trying to block that out of my memory. But he knew that I needed some healing because anger is often an unhealed wound that keeps getting tapped into. And that wound was my mother's death and the sense of abandonment. And so he invited me to go back into prayer to prayerfully imagine myself. That, and that night my mother died and, um, and to ask Jesus, where were you? And it was so amazing. I, I thought it was a dumb exercise, but I trusted my spiritual director. And as I went into prayer, um, my mother, uh, she couldn't breathe because of the, the blood. And she collapsed into my arms and she died in my arms. And I, as I went back into that night in prayer, I, I was experiencing the horror, the, the disbelief, the shock, the sadness. And I said, Jesus, where were you? And, um, you know, the, the Pieta with Mary holding the body of Jesus, it was the reverse of that in this image I got. It was me holding my mother's lifeless body. And then Jesus was wrapped around both of us. 
and I just started to weep in in the chapel. Um, and I knew something shifted in my heart that night that I, I was receiving healing from the Lord because everything from that point on was different. Uh, the anger started to dissipate. And what, what happened was, and I do a lot of work with the John Paul II Healing Center in Tallahassee, Dr. Bob Schutz and Sister Miriam James, who do amazing work in healing. Um, the Lord dispelled the lie that... Um, God had abandoned us. And the truth was Jesus was there with us every step of the way and he was grieving with us. And as the healing took place, I just started to sense this freedom. Uh, the anger dissipated. And now I can talk about my mother. It's been 21 years. I know 20, I'm sorry, 25 years now. I've been a priest 21 years. Uh, I can talk about my mother and smile. I remember the good times. Um, I, re I still remember her death, but it's not it doesn't have control over me like it did uh, for a couple of years. I think sometimes anger as a part of grief serves as almost to protect our hearts, to let our hearts calm down like a, like a scab over a wound. Like mm -hmm. the scab eventually has to go. Um, but sometimes the anger can just kind of separate us a little bit, yeah. give us a chance to, you know, catch our breath and then, at the right time, it's time to pick that angry scab off and and let things heal properly. Yeah. The human person, the way God made us is so amazing. And, you know, to to deal with grief or to, to deal with different things that we experience, there's these coping mechanisms that God gives us. For example, when, if you get a, a serious wound, you know, the body just goes into a reaction where you, you almost don't feel it. Uh, it goes into shock just to protect you from that feeling, you know, and uh, as you say, anger and um, disbelief, denial, all those things are ways of protecting our hearts because we don't want to get hurt again, you know. Mm. Um, but if we can't stay in those places, the key is to continue to, to bring the anger, the denial to the Lord, to let him heal. Um, because sometimes... We, if I had not done the work, I could have been stuck in that anger and, and stayed there the rest of my life. And some people do. And then we, none of us wants to be that person, you know? And so the Lord is the, is the divine physician, the healer who can help us through that process. I mean, but there is always our cooperation with grace. You know, we do have to do work in that grief process. Yes. And sometimes it really sucks. <laughs> it does. It's so it does. hard. <laughs> and as somebody, and I think it's such a, a gift now. Um, my mother's death was not a gift, believe me. But having gone through that and worked through it, now I'm able to walk with others through their grief. I know that God can bring us to the other side of that and help us heal. And so I go into it. I can... I think prior to my mother's death, I couldn't be with someone in their grief because it was too it was too hard to deal with. I, I didn't know raw. what to do with it, too raw. Now I, I understand it. Even though everybody's grief is different, um, I'm comfortable going into that dark place with them, trusting that God can help them through it and just be there, not have none of none of us has the answers to to heal people, but we can journey with them. And just continue to to help them stay close to Jesus. You wrote about trusting that silence of of not trying to fix somebody, just being there, um, not having words necessarily. Um, what what did you call it? Ministry of presence. I thought mm -hmm. that was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Just the ministry of presence, just being there, just yeah. saying, "I'm here. I can't fix it. I can't bring your loved one back." I can't fix your situation, but I can just be here. Yeah. You know, um, being that loving presence. Is That's one of the things they taught us in the seminary was that ministry of presence. And uh, again, men like to fix things. So <laughs> uh, we just want a problem and, and we want, and want to have a solution to it. And so it's really a, a kind of a rewiring for us to, as priests, to say, I can go into a hospital room and not have the answers, not have the solution. Of course, in the back of my mind, I know 
Jesus is the answer to all of our needs, but I can't bring back a loved one. I can't, I can't solve their, their problem, but I can, I can be with them in it to know, especially as a priest, I know that I can be the presence of Christ with them in this journey. And, uh, it really takes all the pressure off because I remember going into ministry thinking, oh, I've got to fix everybody's problems. No, now I have the confidence that Jesus will. And I just, I just try to be with them on that journey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, you dated before you became a priest. And mm -hmm. um, one of the things I love that um, you delved into a little bit in, in the book, um, I wish you had delved into it a little more, mm -hmm. but um, in the next book you will. <laughs> and that is the, the discussion of sex and intimacy and the difference mm -hmm. between the two things when they come mm -hmm. together and, and the difference. Uh, I yes. think it's important for, for seminarians um, that whole discussion, but also for people entering into marriage and people, you know, who for whatever reason are single or in religious life. Yeah. So I, one of my big struggles going into the priesthood was, boy, I have to give up marriage and, and, and sex and children. And, and I thought as our, our, our world teaches us that intimacy equals sex, you know, and I've come to understand that everybody is searching for intimacy and intimacy is meeting another person at the deepest level of the heart. Or as my buddy, Mike Sweeney, who wrote the forward to the book, you know, he says, intimacy is into me. See, it's like when, when I'm speaking with someone and I open my heart and soul to them, that's intimacy. And so I started to realize that there are people who have a lot of sexual relations but have no intimacy because they're not opening their heart. That that sexual act is just an act. Uh, and then there's people like priests and religious who who are celibate or take a vow of chastity that we don't have any sexual relationships, but we have a lot of intimacy. And I can tell you as a priest now for 21 years, the intimacy that I experience is daily and ongoing in you know, people will come to us and say, Father, here's my heart. This is what's going on in my life. I've never told anyone else about this. And that happens all the time. And so, honestly, when I go home at night, I, I relish kind of that quiet time to, one, offer all of this back to God and say, I, I can't carry everybody's burden. Thank you for the gift of these relationships. Thank you for the gift of the priesthood. And I don't feel like not having sexual relations is I'm being deprived of something. And so I try to bring, talk about this in, with couples who are preparing for marriage to realize that I think sometimes we can, you know, we're, we're swimming in our culture. And so we think that it's all about sex and the whole relationship for the rest of my life is going to be about sex, but it's really about intimacy. And as I talk with couples who have been married over, a period of years, you know, the sexual relations may become less frequent, but the intimacy can become greater, you know? And so I, think I always joke eventually everyone becomes celibate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm curious, just for our listeners, how, it's, it's an intimate question, um, how do you maintain, I mean, the human person tends to move towards intimacy and then the body follows. I mean, mm -hmm. we're this body and soul composite here of mm -hmm. some sort. Um, the body follows. How do you maintain the boundaries between being able to be intimate with people um, and loving um, and not have your body follow? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, a few things come to mind. One is, is prayer. I try to do a daily holy hour where my first level of intimacy is with God. And uh, so if that relationship is solid and I maintain really good friendships um, that are healthy and I really try to uh, form friendships with couples, you know, who are my closest friends are usually couples who are in a really good marriage. So I'm not a threat to them. They're not a threat to me. And we can, we can be intimate in that 
level of the heart, but we know that those boundaries are there as far as the physical ones. And so those relationships between me and God and me and other really good friends are meeting my need for intimacy. And so when I'm meeting people here in the office or, you know, in, in a ministerial way, um, I'm not there to, to look for anything for myself. Um, and so, you know, I just, I keep, I keep healthy boundaries by, um, you know, one, if there's young women who come to see me, uh, I make sure that, you know, the doors are, we have a window on the door, um, that those kind of physical, uh, boundaries are there, but also I'm guarding my heart to say, this is a daughter of God. Uh, it's not, this, this person is not for my pleasure and always reminding myself that I'm here to bring them closer to the Lord. So the first part is meeting my own intimacy needs and healthy relationships with God and others, and then helping others form those same kind of relationships. That makes sense. Yeah. So it's something you have to work at, clearly have to work at. It doesn't just happen because no. you were ordained. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There's, there is grace, but definitely have to work at it. Another piece of that too is exercise, you know, to really, uh, I'm, I try to exercise daily and you know, take care of some of those just, physical needs of, you know, just being, being physical. So, um, yeah, it's a really good question. I think, uh, something that if somebody told me when I was first in the seminary that you could meet your intimacy needs in these ways, I, I would have thought they were crazy, but now being a priest for this long, I, I mean, it's really true, um, that it's not about what vocation you're called to, whether you can find intimacy it's how you find it with god and with others yeah thank you i think you know that's a question i think many people have especially young men discerning um you know can i give up marriage family sex for for the kingdom of god yeah. can i do that um i wish more was written about it like more directly well maybe maybe you are inspiring <laughs> me for another book here because that it's a it's a hugely important topic, as you're saying, and uh, you know, it people is, especially, say, you know, coming out of the scandal, people are looking at the scandal, of course, saying, "See, you know, they all should be married. Forget celibacy." And of course, um, you know, one of the things I, I love that one of the questions you said for discerning, you know, new seminarians coming in um, is, you know, would you want this man to be married to your daughter? I love that question. I was actually thinking it before I got that. That would be my question. And then mm -hmm. it came up in your book. Um, you know, and so sometimes I say to people, well, you know, these people who created, the, you know, who were scandalous in the church, would you want them to be married to your daughter? Or who no. exactly did you want them to marry? Because I don't want to be married to them. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of a lot of people equated celibacy with, with uh, you know, child sexual abuse and you know there's a lot of married people who are abusers so it, it's it's not um it's not a matter of you know celibacy or marriage it, it's a matter of um learning to deal with you know your need for intimacy and how you do that in healthy ways you know um and so, power and you know a lot of times it's not about sexuality so much as power even over other mm -hmm. people um, yeah so I, I do think, you know, people do have that question, you know, it's like, especially seeing someone, okay, you're headed into the baseball world, you're headed into the dating, sexy baseball world, and yeah. now all of a sudden you're a priest, like, yeah. that's a huge switch. Um, it is, yeah. I think it's something worth, you know, writing about. Um, I will pray about that, yeah, that's a... One of the things I loved, I, I've written, I taught homiletics at um, Holy Apostles College and Seminary in Cromwell, Connecticut for about six years. Um, and so I smiled when I saw you wrote, I've got it written here. I want to give people something they can take home, and put into practice. And of course, mm -hmm. uh, my home for the homily, the fourth home of the homily is, is home, home, the domestic church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I've, People say that my my homilies tend to be very practical, which is is my goal. I, I do want to teach and you know share some theological concepts, you know, but at the same time, 
as I'm preparing, my question is always, if I were sitting in the pew, what would I take from this? What, what, would, I, what would I carry from this church uh, throughout the week? And, uh, and I've actually come to, I'm kind of known here at my parish, um, I give three points every Sunday. Um, I'm a very logical thinker. So Bishop Barron was one of my professors at Mundelein Seminary. And I took every class I could from him. He's such a, a, a role model. And, and it's interesting now. I'm, I give three points and, you know, I, I give the three points. I discuss them and then I review the three points. And people remember them. You know, that's, and that I had somebody just yesterday say, they were, they were sharing with a friend, these are the three points from the homily. This is what he said. And, and so not only is it something they can take and put into practice, but now they're starting to evangelize with it as well because there's a framework to it. Sometimes uh, just this kind of rambling homily with, you, it's like this flowing river that you don't know where it's going or where it came from. <laughs> you don't know, like, what, what do I take from that? You know, so it might just be my, you know, I studied math in college. I, I think very logically and I, I find Bishop Barron is that way. Like he's very clear and I try to follow that path so so people can remember something. Yeah, it's exciting to hear that. I mean, the homily, if it doesn't make it home, it's it's lost. It's homeless. I call it the homeless homily. Yeah. It's got to get it's got to make it all the way home. Yeah, um, yeah, if, if they're discussing your homily at dinner, that's uh that's amazing, you know. Right. <laughs> yes, that's what you want. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Looking here. You talk about God being, I love this, God um, is in the interruptions of life. You were just saying you're, you're very logical and you like things very ordered, um, but that didn't happen always once you became a priest in a, in a parish. Yeah. It's, it's a crazy place. <laughs> I would, I've always been a list maker, you know, my to-do list. And uh, prior to priesthood, I could usually finish my list, clear my desk. You know, I love having a clean desk. You can see my desk right now. You would laugh. And uh, so in priesthood, I was making lists. And then as soon as I try to go to number one, the phone would ring, you know, Father, can you anoint so-and-so? Okay. Come back and do that. Come back. Go back to the list. Father, we need you at the hospital. And I found myself, I don't think people knew it, but internally I was getting frustrated, like, how they're taking me away from my list, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing. And then when I'd go to my spiritual director each month and talk about those God moments, they were always in the interruptions. And so it was like God was teaching me that this isn't about your list and, and your plan, but look for me in the interruptions. Look for me in those phone calls and the person who's knocking on your door. And it changed the way I viewed ministry rather than, you know, people are here to work around my schedule. It's it's the opposite, and I still have my list, but it keeps getting longer and longer, I, I, and I've become comfortable knowing that my list will never get done, and that's okay, but God is working in the interruptions. In a sense, your, your whole life story that you've put here is one giant interruption. <laughs> I, my, my initial, early on, the, the title for the book was going to be, in my mind, was if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. I've seen that bumper sticker. But yes. uh, but Word on Fire came up with this title. And I, I really it seems to um, ring with people, you know. It's easy to remember, so I think yeah. it is a good title. Yeah. yeah, a grand slam for God. When I became Catholic, um, I remember going to my my Episcopal priest and saying to him, or no, not my Episcopal priest, my my new one of my new Catholic priests, and saying, my biggest fear in becoming Catholic is that I'm going to be asked to give up every beautiful and treasured experience that I've had with God in you know other parishes, other churches, um, in Protestant churches, in the Anglican Church, um, that I have to sort of give that all up. And he said, no, anything that's good, true, and beautiful, you get to bring with you. <laughs> um, it was a beautiful answer. And, and I, I, you know, his, the pastoral care was there, um, which I was very grateful for. You talk about in your book the importance of pastoral care yeah. for all of us. Um, but also that God doesn't 
take away things from us. He, he uses them differently yeah. than we thought. <laughs> yeah, so he didn't take away. I, I thought, here, I'm giving up baseball to go to the seminary. And then I became chaplain for the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> Got to be part of their World Series victory in 2016. I was dating somebody and I had to give her up and I got to marry her anyway, but to my good friend, <laughs> second, second I wedding I witnessed. That. Yeah. Um, as soon as you introduced the two of them, I thought she's going to marry that guy. Yes. <laughs> I was just, I was just texting him yesterday. Um, we remain great friends to this day. And so you I always use the analogy. Your children. What's that? I baptized their yeah. children. Um, it's just been a grace. And my experience is, like at Mass, when we offer the bread and the wine, gifts that God has given us, we offer them back to him. He takes them, blesses them, consecrates them, and gives them back to us as his own body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. Similarly, with the gifts God has given us in life, when we offer them back to him, he receives them blesses them, multiplies them, and gives them back to us in ways that we never imagined. And that's been my whole life. And it, I can't wait to see what happens next because the first 56 years have been a, an amazing ride. An amazing ride. Yes, absolutely. I'm always amazed by what God does that I could never have imagined. I yeah. know we don't have a lot of time, but I'd like you to just quickly touch on one more thing. Um you said because so many of us feel it. We feel it even in mar we feel it in marriage. We feel it if we're single. Um, and it was one of your your fears going into the priesthood was the fear of loneliness. Mm -hmm. um, and you said that loneliness is God's. First of all, it's part of the human condition. <laughs> we yeah. all, um, but you said loneliness is God's invitation to intimacy in Him. That was a huge learning point. So I was a new vocation director. Bishop Sarton, uh, who went on to become the Archbishop of Seattle, now retired, he was with me. And this young man asked me, Father, do you ever get lonely? And I, at, at the time, I thought only priests and religious got lonely, you know, because we weren't married. And I thought, if I say no, I'm lying, and I can't lie. And if I say yes, how can I sell the priesthood, you know, because I was the vocation director. And so I just kind of stood there stumped. And Bishop Sarton saw that, so he stepped in, and he he said, absolutely, we get lonely. But so do married people, single people. He said, it's a part of the human condition. God created us with a longing in our hearts that only he can fill. And then he said that line. He said, loneliness is God's invitation to intimacy with him. And this is so important because prior to this, when I would get lonely, I would maybe turn on a baseball game or call a friend. And those are good things. You know, they're not bad things. Some people, unfortunately, turn to pornography or other destructive things. And, uh, but what my heart is looking for, like when I'm hungry, my body is looking for food. And if I ate bonbons and ice cream all day long, my body would fall apart, you know? And so when I'm lonely or I have that longing in my heart, my, my body, my, my soul is saying, I'm looking for God. And so we can give, you know, substitutes for God, or we can go to prayer. We can go, you know, prayer, scripture, the sacraments. And that's like a, the best steak dinner we can have, you know, when we're hungry. Uh, our hearts need God. And then, you know, seek first the kingdom of God, and then, then the other things will fall into place. So pay attention to what or who you turn to when you're lonely, and uh, it'll, it'll define a lot of things in your life. Again, that steak dinner is harder to prepare than the bonbons. It's so we do have to work at our life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, going to adoration is not easy, you know, or going to confession and mass. It, it's a lot easier to sit there and watch TV or scroll on our phones and just kind of do some mindless things, but it's not meeting the ultimate need. Sometimes I have to, before I get up in the morning, I just have to pray, God, I, I just, I can't get to Mass today. I can't get out of this bed. I can't move. So if, if, if you want me at Mass, get me up. You know. So at least I'm like, okay, you do something. And the next yeah. thing I know is, you know, I have to go to the bathroom and I jump out of bed. I wash my face and then all of a sudden I realize I'm up and I just laugh. 
yep. you know, you know, lay out, you know, telling God what your plans are. <laughs> exactly. God has, I, I've been amazed in my life at how much God, I mean, my, it's been a, in uh, different ways, but a similar journey to yours. I, I thought I was going in one direction and, you know, it, 15 years ago, I never would have crossed my mind that I'd be doing interviews on the Catholic bookworm. So um, I was ready to kind of curl up and die at that point in my life. So God had another another plan for me. Um, so th it was really exciting to read your book. I love it. Um, is there anything that you wanted to mention that we didn't get covered? There's so much in the book. It's just a delight to read. Again, no, I think we've covered them. Yeah, thank you. Man's Slam for God, um, a journey from baseball star to Catholic priest, Father Burke Masters. Uh, I keep hearing from... Published the Word on Fire, Bishop Barron's Word on Fire. We love Bishop Barron in this household. <laughs> We've watched all of his, you know, all of his series with our study groups, and uh, he's just a great delight and a blessing. Yeah, it, I'm so blessed to have Word on Fire publish the book because he has over a million people on his mailing list, and uh, I'm hearing from people all over the world who I wouldn't have been able to reach that through his marketing arm, they, they're reading the book. Um, I had someone from Guatemala uh, say, she said, my husband is an atheist, but he loves the Cubs. And so uh, he ended up getting the book, reading the book and is reconsidering his stance on, on Jesus and God. And I thought if it's just for that one person, it's worth it, you know? Right, right. But there's just so many people you'll be able to touch their lives, and that's beautiful. That's a grand slam. <laughs> Thank you Would for you... your time and for the opportunity to share uh, the book on uh, on the show. Very exciting. Would you like to end us with a prayer? Sure. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to share about the book. May it uh, touch hearts and bring people closer to you, to your Son, to the Holy Spirit. And Mother Mary, wrap your mantle around us and protect us always. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. And again, the book is available through Word on Fire. And I assume it's available on Amazon as well. Correct. Amazon and uh, Barnes and & Noble. And Barnes and Noble, wonderful, wonderful Christmas gift. Christmas is coming up. A great, a great, um, great gift for young people, especially. Mm. Um, yeah, I think uh, people of all ages, but I have a lot of people who are saying they're buying them for their their children and their grandchildren. Even I've had, uh, you know, as young as fourth and fifth graders read the book and uh, get excited about it. So, uh, and then people who are in their eighties and nineties as well. So it's exciting. It's a fun book. It's exciting. It makes us realize how absolutely exciting and wonderful Catholicism is, the priesthood, um, but also married life, family life, um, that we're all in this together. So I really thank you for that, Father. You're welcome. Praise God. And write, and write that next book. All right. I'm going <laughs> to <Come start>, back. <laughs> start praying about that. Yes. Thank you. God bless. God bless.